Hi, Pastor John here. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for spending some time with us. Today, we continue our series, Lessons for Today from the OT. We'll be in Judges 6, where we read the story of Gideon. And we hear that Gideon was a man who feared quite a bit. The question of the day is, what are you afraid of? Because we're going to find out through Gideon's story that God doesn't always remove our fear, but can do some amazing things despite it, if we're willing to trust him. I'd like you to turn to the book of Judges. We're going to be in chapter 6, verses 33 through 40. There's another in our ongoing series on lessons for today from the OT. And while you're finding that, let me talk to you about phobia. Uh, Phobia is an unreasonable fear. There are all sorts of different phobias. Here are just a few. There's a palatophobia. It's a fear of baldness or bald people. Don't overreact. There's aerophobia. It's fear of drafts. There's porphyrophobia, the fear of the color purple. I kid you not. There's chetophobia, the fear of hairy people. I guess it's the opposite of palatophobia. There's levophobia, the fear of objects on the left side of the body. And there is dextrophobia, the fear of objects on the right side of the body. There's auroraphobia, it's a fear of the northern lights. I guess we don't have to worry about that too much around here. There's calephrophobia, the fear of being seated. Odontophobia, the fear of teeth. Gaphrophobia. The fear of writing in public and phobophobia, you can probably guess what that is, right? It's a fear of being afraid. (laughs) So with all these phobias floating around, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? What what grips you in fear? We're going to talk to you today about a man named Gideon, a man who was afraid of a lot of things. And there are three pivotal events in Gideon's life we're going to take a look at in our passage today. We're going to see Gideon's anxiety in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 15. We'll see his anointing in 16 through 35. And then we'll see Gideon's assurance in 36 through 40. So let me give you the the setting here. In Judges chapter 6, Midian, you remember Midian? That's where Balaam was from, Midian. The, the recurring enemies of, of Israel. So in Judges chapter 6, Midian and Amalek are opposing Israel. They've come against Israel. They're in the promised land, they've taken it, and now they're having some trouble. And what we find Israel living in caves and hiding out from the Midianites. So let me show you the region here on this map. This is the region we're talking about. Uh, Here's Midian, where the red is down there towards the bottom. There's a circle. Uh, Then we have the location of our passage, which is 250 miles from Midian. They're they're a pretty long way from Midian. And and we're going to find out that Gideon's having a hard time with these people. And so here's a path that the Midianites and the Amalekites are taking through Israel, and they're just wreaking havoc. They're, they're taking crops. They're taking livestock. They're, they're raiding villages. And uh, verse 6 of, of Judges 6 says, And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And, and we find out that Israel does what they always do. They're, they get in trouble. They cry out to the Lord. And God responds by calling this reluctant chap, champion, a guy named Gideon. Gideon's father is in a Beazerite, his little clan in this area. And, and get, we find Gideon hiding from the Midianites. He's, he's making wine, and he's gone into a cave, and he's afraid that the Midianites and the Amalekites are going to come and take his wine. So here, here's Gideon's anxiety. Here's Gideon's fear. An angel of the Lord visits him and calls him, watch this, a mighty man of valor. And so Gideon is not a mighty man of valor, at least not at this point. And his reaction is, 
me? <laughs> so I, 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 I'm really not anybody. He says, I'm the least of my father's house. And, and so the angel says, it's okay. I'll be with you when you strike Midian. Now, this is a guy hiding in a cave to protect his grapes. And he says, you're going to come out of the cave and battle Midian. And in response, Gideon says, show me a sign. I hear what you're saying. I'm standing in this cave, and an angel shows up and says, I'm going to attack Midian, and I'm, I'm afraid to come out of this cave. I'm going to need some sign from you. So Gideon says, show me a sign. And he says, wait here. Don't go away. And he goes away, and he prepares a young goat. He, he makes the angel dinner. And, and the angel of the Lord, in verses 19 through 24, touches his staff to a rock, and fire jumps up out of the rock and consumes a goat. Well, Gideon wanted a sign. That's a pretty good one. Fire out of nowhere. And then, then the angel just disappears. So Gideon gets two signs for one. And, and what the angel wants Gideon to do is to tear down the altar of Baal. Now, that Baal is, as we learned from our story about Balaam, is the primary god of the Midianites and the Amalekites. And, and tearing down the altar that they built to Baal would certainly cause trouble with both of these groups, who are already a lot of trouble for Israel. And Gideon does it. He does it. it, it, it it's actually... A kind of a brave move. But look at the way he does it. Verse 27 of Judges 6. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. You see that? He's not afraid of the Midianites. He's afraid of the people in his town. And the reason he's afraid of the people in the town is if he causes trouble for the Midianites, they're going to cause more trouble for the people in the town. So we see this reluctant champion who's ready to respond to the call of God, but he's afraid. And you know what? I don't know that I can blame him. I think that fear is justifiable. Things aren't going so well for Israel. The Midianites and the Amalekites, they're, they're, they're scary. They're so scary that God's people are, are hiding in caves, doing everything they can to avoid them. And Gideon is concerned that now that he's done this thing, that his own people are going to turn on him. And the surprising thing is, this is just the beginning of Gideon's story. God's preparing Gideon for something much larger than what he's been called to do here. And in preparation for that, we see Gideon's anointing, starting in verse 33, going through 35. So verse 33 says, Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan, and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. Now this is an invasion. It, it, they've been, there's been guerrilla tactics going on up until now. Now the armies are here, they're invading the earlier map showed the region, and now we see these three nations on this map. Uh, they're incensed by Gideon's actions that people of the east are now joining them, and they march up, up the Jordan and across the river and into the Jezreel Valley north of Jerusalem, south of the Sea of Galilee, and they camp in, in Gideon's backyard. It's a huge army. It's an act of war. And the Midianites and the Amalekites have been bullying Israel, and now they're invading because Gideon had the temerity to tear down the altar to their God. And look, look, what, look what our great God does in verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. Now what we should see here is this. Somehow, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, supernaturally engulfs Gideon. Covers him. Comes upon him. This scared man of little stature and not very much self-confidence that seems to need more of a sign to 
to prove that God's moving to him, more of a sign than an angel appearing with his grapes in a cave, giving him the word of God, the Spirit descends on this man. You might say he's filled. We would call this a filling in the New Testament. We see it in the Old Testament too. And a transformation occurs. Something inside Gideon happens. And it says, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him. Now, Gideon sounds his call to battle, and look who the first ones to respond are. His own people, the Abiezrites, the, the ones who wanted to kill him for pulling down the altar of Baal. They're the first ones, but they're not the only ones that come. Verse 35 says, And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. So God's people from the whole region surrounding Gideon respond to this call. And now they have an army large enough to battle three nations. But you've got to ask yourself, why now? What was going on prior to this? Why now? Why Gideon? These people have been harassing the Jews for quite some time now, humiliating them, causing them to hide. And all of a sudden, this unassuming man makes a rally cry, and they all come running. They're all ready to fight back. Was Gideon that great of a leader? We keep on reading in the next couple passages. You're going to find out, no. No, he wasn't that great of a leader. Matter of fact, he comes, kind of, comes to kind of an ignoble end. So what's going on? Brothers and sisters, this is an example of God's perfect timing. That this is what's happening here. It's a further example of God equipping his people. It happens in his time and by his will and by his power. And he's equipping his people at the right time to do the things that he's called them to do for his glory. Gideon is clothed in God's spirit, enabled by God to do something that most un, at a most unusual time in Israel's history, something that he's kind of afraid to do. But if Gideon is enabled, that still doesn't explain this response of God's people. Why are they ready now to fight back? Well, the Scripture doesn't really tell us. But I'll tell you something, I don't have any doubt in my mind that the same Spirit of God that moved on Gideon is also now moving on his children. Enabling them and empowering them to do what God wants them to do. Urging them to do what He calls them to do. To rid the land of this stain that covers it. Brothers and sisters, we, we need to listen carefully to this. This is not just about some historic happening. But... These people have invaded God's promised land. They've moved on God's people. And God's people, watch this, are unable and unwilling to do anything about it until until God enables them, until God gives them the power to do it. That's us. We're unable and frequently unwilling to do anything about the sin that creeps in our lives. But brothers and sisters, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've confessed your sin and repented, you have the Holy Spirit in you. We don't have to wait for it to come from somewhere. We already have the Spirit inside us. And He can empower us to do these things. It's just, it's just a little example of, of what happens when the Spirit starts moving in the lives of God's people. And in this case, in Judges chapter 6, God is anointed a leader to show them how to do it, but that leader, because he is afraid, needs some assurance. So we see more evidence of Gideon's fear in what happens next. This this great army, and Kelly and I have had the privilege of being at Gideon Springs. You can see the mountain that the Midianites were on about three miles away. It's a large mountain. The Midianites and the Amalekites covered the mountain. At night, you could see their torches burning. 
and it lit up that mountain. There are literally tens of thousands, if not 100,000 troops sitting on that mountain waiting to attack Gideon. So they're camped out on this mountain in the Jezreel Valley, which, by the way, is the Valley of Armageddon. Gideon has received this calling, and he's kind of confident in it. I mean, the bell thing kind of worked out, didn't it? But he's afraid. Then Gideon said to God, verse 36, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. Now notice, Gideon is a godly man. He's not saying, if you want me to save Israel. He's saying, if I am going to save Israel by your hand, if you, God, are going to save Israel, Gideon knows that he is a tool in the hands of God. He knows he's being used. But he's not quite sure how God is going to do this. And as we've said frequently, we know he's afraid. So, he says in verse 37, Behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. I love this. Because I used to throw fleeces all over the place. God, if you want me to buy the blue cars, show me a fleece. <laughs> we got to be careful with that. Gideon has this fleece idea. He said, and he says, if there's dew on the fleece alone and it's dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Gideon asked for what? A sign. What Gideon's really saying is, you know, the signs I've seen aren't quite enough. I need some more signs. So I'm going to ask you to do this thing with the fleece. It's the most unusual thing to ask. Verse 38, and it was so when he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, He wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. It's an amazing request, particularly in light of everything else that Gideon has seen and heard, even with the signs and miracles. Gideon's still unsure of his calling, and God graciously, this is an example of God's grace, God graciously grants Gideon's request. (laughs) The amazing thing is, Gideon's not convinced yet. So, in verse 39, he says to God, let not your anger burn against me, and you can see his knees knocking. I hope you can see that. Don't, 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 get, don't get mad, but, but I still need some help. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Now Gideon's testing God. It's amazing. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let, let there be dew. Now, Gideon's delayed this whole thing by two days so far, right? Verse 40, and God did so that night. Huh. And it was dry on the fleece only, and all the ground there was dew. So now, now Gideon said, well, could you do it the other way? Could you do it the opposite? And God does. Now, between you and me, I, I believe with all my heart, Gideon is skating on thin ice here. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I can see God going, how many tests do you need? And smite him, you know how I love that word. But he doesn't. He keeps asking for a sign, and God keeps providing one. But watch this, because God gives him all these signs not to impress him, not to get his attention, but because he's calling Gideon to battle. So we need to be careful about asking for signs. They're not there for our amusement, brothers and sisters. They're not there to affirm our faith. At least in Gideon's case, they're there because Gideon is called to do something that is extremely difficult, if not impossible. So we've seen these these pivotal moments in Gideon's life. We've seen this anxiety. Gideon has no self-confidence. His family's not prominent. They're not looking to Gideon for, the village isn't looking to Gideon for leadership. He comes from a small clan. And he's so doubtful of his calling that he needs these multiple signs and miracles to to even begin to walk in it. And what we find out, Gideon's perfect for the job. He's absolutely perfect. Gideon has no capability 
to do what God has called him to do. Gideon cannot rely on his talents and his giftings. You know, the angel calls him a man of valor. He's not. He's not a man of valor. He's, a, he's, he's an afraid little guy. And what we find out is that God uses the incapable to do amazing things. Well, why would God do that? Because God doesn't want Gideon to get the glory for the victories that he has in his people. For God to get the glory. When the angel calls him valiant warrior, it's not because Gideon is going to become a brave, heroic warrior. It's going to, it's going to be because Gideon, God is going to uniquely enable him to win a miraculous victory. And, and yes, Gideon's name will be advanced, but it will be advanced because Gideon has a great God. Not because he's a great warrior. We saw Gideon's anointing. The Spirit fell on Gideon. A Spirit so powerful and so compelling that it helped him overcome his fear. Notice it didn't eliminate Gideon's fear. Did you catch that? didn't wash Gideon's fear away. There was no magic wand waved over Gideon and said, I am brave, now I can do this. God used Gideon despite his fear. He used him anyway. All Gideon had to do, all Gideon, if you walk away from this today with, without learning anything at all, learn this. All Gideon had to do was trust his Father in heaven. The only battle Gideon had. We saw Gideon's assurance. So we, we need to be really careful not to use Gideon's story as a set of guidelines for how to approach God. We can't be asking God to continually prove himself to us. If we do, we're in danger of being picked for the next leader of the battle, the next leader of the impossible battle before us. God was very patient with Gideon. Why? Well, because he was about to ask Gideon not to do something hard, but to do something impossible. In Judges chapter 7, if you read on the story, you find out that God sends Gideon against this vast army of the Amalekites and the Midianites and the people from the east with only 300 men. He's got 30,000 guys standing there. God says, that's too many guys. What do you do? Oh, send these people home. 10,000 go away. And God says, well, Gideon has still too many guys. You can see Gideon doing the numbers. Hmm? <laughs> and by the time God is done weaning everybody out, Gideon has 300 men. And God said, that's the right number. So that God gets the glory. Here's what happens in Judges chapter 7, verse 9, just to show you Gideon's state of mind. Judges 7, verse 9. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. Verse 10 says, But if you are afraid to go down to the camp, go with Pura, your servant. And verse 7 says, and you shall hear what they, verse 11 says, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go against the camp. Then he, Gideon, went with Pura. You, you catch that? If you're afraid, take Pura. I got him. <laughs> I'm afraid. Gideon was afraid of Lot. But God used him anyway. Do you think Gideon was afraid earlier? I mean, it, it, when, when you see that initial fear, you think that was fear? How afraid do you think it was when God says, I want you to go against these people with only 300 guys, and I want you to do it with a bunch of pottery and some candles? Because that's what he asked them to do. He says, surround this vast army and have these, these candles burning in these pots. And when I give you the signal, break the pots and expose the candles. I mean, we thought 
Joshua had a hard job at Jericho? I'm going to ask you to walk around the city seven times and then shout. (laughs) Now Gideon's going against a much larger army, far better equipped. He's doing it with a bunch of pots and candles. It's an amazing moment. God may not alleviate your fears. He may not put you in a situation where you feel particularly capable of doing it. But God can still use you in all your fear and all your weakness and inability. God can use you and me, brothers, for his glory. Amen? So that's a good practical lesson. We can see that in here. Here's another one. God doesn't need much from you. He doesn't need a lot from you. All he really wants you to do is trust him. I don't know what you're going through right now. I know what some of you are going through. And I know how hard it is. And I'm sure there are others that are going through things even harder. And God doesn't want your capability to get through that situation. He just wants your trust. He just wants your faith in him. That's all he asked of Gideon. Just trust me. And, and, and he did work to build Gideon up. Oh, pull that altar down. And you can see Gideon probably, oh, that was so hard. Praise God, it's done. And God's sitting on the throne going, wait a minute, Gideon. I'm just getting you ready for something larger. What larger thing is Gideon getting you, is God getting you ready for? And how will you prepare for that? God says, trust me. You don't have to become a valiant warrior. You don't have to work up your courage. You don't have to have a plan. All you have to do is trust me. Gideon was valiant because God said he was. Not because he learned to wield his sword, not because he went into training and became a warrior, not because he gained experience in battle. Gideon was a guy that grew grapes and made wine in a cave. God didn't need Gideon's expertise. All he needed was his trust. So those are good lessons, amen? But I told you earlier that every passage in the Old Testament will reveal something about God, something about His character and nature, something about His plan of redemption for His chief people. What does God reveal about Himself here? Well, God anoints Gideon. The Spirit falls on Gideon. He anoints Gideon to lead his people against the enemy. And that's just a shadow. It's just a shadow of what God is going to do with His only Son, Jesus Christ, who will be anointed to do what He's called to do. Acts 10, starting in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. As for the word that He sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptisms that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. God reveals his hand and what he will do with his son and what he does with Gideon. And did Jesus win that victory? Well, kind of. But even that points to a greater victory because one day Jesus will return riding on a white horse, leading his army against an enemy that is extremely powerful and leading his army for one final glorious victory. And and you and I, those of us who have confessed our sin and follow him, get to be in that army and we will win that battle. How do we know that? Because brothers and sisters, we have been anointed. We have the same anointing that Gideon had. The same anointing that fell on Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. And who has also put His seal on us and given us the Spirit in our hearts 
as a guarantee. So we have an even greater assurance than Gideon has. We don't need a fleece, brothers and sisters. We don't need God to prove himself. We have the Holy Spirit. So today, what are you afraid of? What phobias creep up in your mind during the day? We have victory over all of our phobias. You know what? It doesn't mean the phobias are going to go away, right? Gideon's fear never went away. But his trust in God was greater than his fear. And what we find out is when our trust in God is greater than our fear, our fear of our situation, our fear of what might happen, when our trust in God is greater than that, then we have victory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the assurance of your victory. And Lord, while while it may look like things are falling apart around us from time to time, it may look like we would be overwhelmed with the situation. It may look like the things that you call us to do are impossible to do, Father. We have your anointing. We've been empowered by you, and we pray, Father, that we would gain that trust in you that allows us to walk in the calling that you've placed upon us. Allows us to walk in a manner worthy of that calling, Father. Allows us to walk in the victory that you've given us, Father. Not that we might have victory over riches and all of the world situations, but we might have victory over sin. The sin that would hinder our testimony. The sin that would, would impede the church from being everything that you've called it to do. We would have victory over that. And the confidence that because of your indwelling spirit, that one day all these things will be washed away. We will stand with you in glory. We give you praise, Father. We give you honor. In the name of our Lord and Savior, the victorious Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in with us today. We'll be back next week. Mm -hmm. Pastor John back here again. If you are blessed by the service, let me ask you to do us a favor. Click on the like button below, that little thumbs up icon. If you're listening on sermon audio, perhaps you can comment or even share the sermon with someone else. We'd be blessed by that. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter at WBFVA. And we're also on the World Wide Web at WBFVA.org. Let us know if you'd like us to pray for you. If you'd like to support us financially, you can make donations through our website at wbfva.org. Just click on giving and follow the links from there. You'll receive a tax deductible receipt at the end of the year. Either way, we would love to hear from you or even have you visit us in person one Sunday. We meet at 46 Winchester Street in historic downtown Warrington, Virginia at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. And now, may God bless you richly until we gather again.